Okay, good morning everyone. I think it's a, it's a good time to get started. So thank you very much for joining us on this morning's webinar, which is Leadership Behaviour Exiting a Crisis. Hopefully you can all see my uh, PowerPoint slide being shared with you. Um, I'm delighted to welcome James Fowler. James is a lecturer in management at the Essex Business School. Um, and this is the second webinar he's given, the one he did previously, which was on um, leadership in small and medium teams in uh, crisis uh, periods. Um, just as a, an introduction, uh, James is going to be talking for about 25-ish minutes um, and then we're going to, to hold a Q&A at the end. If you've got any questions uh, and you're using Zoom, what you have at the bottom is a Q&A function. Uh, if you're on a laptop or a PC, if you uh, scroll uh, move your mouse to the bottom of the screen that should hopefully pop up i think if you're on apple products if you're on an ipad or anything like that you have to swipe from the left if you've got any questions um, please put those through um through the q a function as they come to you throughout the course of the presentation and what we'll do is we'll hold those back uh, until james has finished his presentation uh, at the end and we'll we'll pose those to him so um Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to James and say thank you very much. Good morning and uh, over to you. Good morning, Andy. Thanks very much indeed. And uh, morning to everyone. So this morning I'm going to look at um, uh, how things have moved on in the month or so since um, I last gave the webinar. Um, and we're going to look at how leadership behaviour has changed and how it ought to change. So the method by which I'm going to deliver this is a little bit different. Last time I was very directive um, and I offered a lot of sort of very direct advice about what I all thought that people ought to be doing in order to promote uh, improve the communications uh, within their teams in light of the new circumstances that they faced. But uh, in this webinar, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back uh, and encourage people to be a little bit more reflective. And what I'm going to do, in fact, is ask you uh, a number of questions to think about and, and consider while I'm talking. And that kind of transition from being quite directive and authoritative um, to being a little bit more step back, a little bit more strategic is in fact in line with the kind of change in leadership behavior that I'm going to advocate um, uh, over the next sort of 25 minutes or so as this crisis evolves, because we are about to enter a new phase. We're already in a, quite a different place to where we were uh, a month ago. So um, I'm going to start with this proposition. And you've probably heard um, quite often in the media this idea that we're all in the same boat um, uh, as concerns this, uh, this crisis. It's quite a nice aphorism. Um, I'm going to disagree with that slightly uh, and say that what we're actually all in is the same kind of storm, um, the same kind of wider condition, shall we say. But in fact, that the boats we occupy are radically different. And in order to kind of understand the transition and manage the transition effectively, this has to be the, the sort of the intellectual starting point that we as managers and leaders begin from. Because people's understanding of risk and the perception of risk has been radically reconditioned um, by what's happened, but it's been radically reconditioned in very different ways. Um, and I'm going to explore some of those um, uh, over the next 10 minutes or so. The first or the next thing we need to draw out of that really is that uh, whilst obviously the, the losses from lockdown are quite clear uh, and I think quite readily understandable to us all because of the nature of the way we're living at the moment, um, it's also important to acknowledge there have been winners as well, um, surprising as that might be. Uh, and again, as leaders and managers, as we supervise and oversee the gradual return uh, to work. We need to be aware of this as well. And I'm going to explore uh, exactly what that looks like. Eventually, I will conclude at the end and I will offer some practical tips. But this in many ways is, is more of a session where I'm going to be asking the questions uh, in many ways and encouraging you to have a think about what you think some of the answers are. So that's the background then. Uh, we are all in the same storm um, um, and in the widest sense, um, but we are in very different places. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. That's the starting point um, for all of this. So I'm going to move now to look at how risk perception works and offer some theory on that and then go a little bit more specialised. Um, we'll begin with just this classic observation that basically when we look at changing people's behaviours, uh, there's a lot of things going on underneath. And what's going on un underneath is a great deal more important um, uh, than what we actually see on the surface. And the purpose of this presentation really um, is to get underneath the bonnet um, uh, and explore a few of those things. So next slide, please, Andy. Right, here we have the classic uh, risk matrix, which you've no doubt seen um, on numerous previous occasions. You've got probability along the bottom uh, and magnitude up at the top. 
and rationally um, you would expect that the interest or, or what would fixate people's interest in organizations or, or wider society be any events that go up in the in the top right hand corner if you could just click one further forward there we go so that should be um, our area of interest but if we look at some of the ideas that have been looked, um, examined by Daniel Kahneman uh, in his book Thinking Fast Thinking Slow we can see that Ironically, or, or perhaps surprisingly, that isn't actually true. Um, so something up in the top right hand corner might, for example, be smoking. It's something that we know uh, was fairly prevalent. So the probability of someone smoking is fairly high, not that long ago. And we also knew that it was quite a, a lethal activity. You could argue the magnitude of the risk that people were undertaking was quite big. Um, but curiously, smoking didn't really fixate society all that much. It took decades um, for people to change their behavior in that respect. And the reason, in fact, um, if we just do another click, um, Andy, is that in in fact, people are far more fixated by rare events, um, especially, of course, if they have a, a sort of very high magnitude or very high um, uh, fallout from all of that. And the reason for that, a um, couple more clicks, please, Andy, is that basically what happens, ironically, even if something happens quite often and is quite lethal and you would think that would you know, magnetize people's attention, the fact that it happens relatively often means that people are actually willing to undertake quite dangerous things. Um, normally because it's normal um, uh, it, it's observable it's not unfamiliar it's not strange and so it's really the things that are alien uh, or new to us um, uh, that we sort of transfix our uh, or transfix us or, or um, um, you, uh, draw our attention if you just another click there Andy there we go so it's what's alien really that um, um, that um, magnetizes us that changes our behavior uh, that influences us and it's ironic because actually those events are relatively improbable they're relatively rare uh, and we tend to let what is more familiar but more dangerous for its familiarity slide by so that's i think quite an interesting abstract theory about how people perceive risk and why perceptions of risk are not what you would rationally expect them to be um, if we trade off the probability of something happening against the um, uh, the magnitude of the outcome so i'm just going to zoom in a little bit um, and look at this um, um, in terms of diseases um, which obviously is the the, the item of interest <laughs> um, uh, in uh, today um, if we start off with something like gout for example down there in the bottom left now the truth is the chance of getting gout are pretty low um, it's not very pleasant but it's scarcely lethal and I'd hazard a guess that so, you know, scarcely any of us uh, spend a great deal of time concerned about you know, what might happen if we catch gout moving over something like food poisoning I think we can probably accept as basically inevitable uh, in the course of human life it, it's fairly probable it doesn't happen all the time um, but although it's unpleasant again it, it's not really going to be fatal so we probably spend a certain amount of time concerned about uh, making sure we don't eat the wrong things but it's not something that really worries us or, or, or sort of you know, shapes our behavior on a, on a daily basis so let's move up um, into the, the top right hand corner where we really ought to be thinking uh, and really ought to be changing what we do um, and cancer I think is the most um, uh, is one of the most obvious ones here so it kills about 500 people a day on average in the United Kingdom um, and I think it would be wrong to say that we ignore it uh, we don't ignore it but bear in mind what I said earlier about smoking um, because in a funny way it is so prevalent um, uh, regrettably it, it's been normalized so we do work on trying to eliminate it but actually if in terms of actually changing our behaviors in terms of things that cause cancer like smoking it's actually quite hard um, to change people um, uh, in that way so let's go over into the the top left um, and we'll look at AIDS when it arrived in the 1980s uh, and it shocked society um, um, it was a great furore over its arrival it wasn't actually very probable um, that anyone was going to catch it um, but of course the magnitude was very severe it was it was lethal um, it was fatal um, and consequently um, it actually attracted a great deal of attention now I think the point we need to think about here is that diseases don't stand still um, they evolve over time medical science advances and more importantly public opinion gradually accepts normalizes the phenomena so I'd suggest that AIDS has moved a little bit it's become a little bit less fatal over the years um, but perhaps more importantly it's become more accepted for what of a better word it's not as novel as it was in 1982 so let's bring this up to date then to where we currently stand with COVID-19 and at the moment I would suggest in a, in a broad brush sense uh, COVID-19 occupies this space in the public perception it is still very new it is still very novel it's very alien uh, consequently there's been enormous enforced behavioral change on the, on the basis of it however I think we're on a journey um, and if we can just um, click once again Andy there we go 
gradually over time, I'm going to suggest that the, the diseases or the, the virus um, is going to make a move over to the, the right hand side in that position. But the point, I think, to extrapolate from all of this as managers and leaders is that that journey is going to be radically different um, for different people. Um, and there are very many different individual views on how fast we're traveling along that line and perhaps where that line has originated from and ultimately where it is going to. So I'm going to leave that there just as a kind of a, a, an introduction, really, to the risk in the widest sense of the word, the theories that lie behind it and a little bit of application. Uh, and I'm now going to get much more specific uh, and talk about individuals and ask you a few questions, really, um, about where you stand on this matter. So. It's pretty evident um, from social media, um, um, from the wider media, um, and indeed just from watching people's behavior out on the streets that there is a very, very wide spectrum of opinion um, about what people need to do and how people perceive what's going on here. So we can put this on a, on a continuum. I think that's quite useful. Over on the left, it's very clear that there are a significant number of people who are really very concerned about the possibility uh, of catching the virus. Um, it's an unpleasant experience. Um, it, you might be hospitalized. Uh, and worse still, it, it might even be fatal. But over on the right hand side, um, it's also quite clear um, that there are a very significant number of people who in a sense are fatalistic about this. They're, they've normalized it. And notice my use of language there. Over on the left, there's people who talk about the possibility uh, and how the possibility can be managed or maybe even eliminated. And over on the right, the discourse is much more about probabilities. The idea that the, the, the virus is endemic, we're probably all going to catch it at some point or another. Uh, and it's just about accepting that, uh, getting over it and moving on. So if we place those um, uh, on, a, on a simple continuum, I think it's quite a valuable little reflective moment here. Um, and please do have a think about this while I'm, I'm talking to decide exactly where it is you stand on this matter. Um, and to help you, I'm just going to put myself on the, uh, on the continuum there. There you go, that's roughly where I stand. Now that's fine. Um, but the issue is that if I am managing uh, a team of people or if I'm managing an organization at whatever level uh, and I have to draw up a policy about how people are going to return to work, when they're going to return to work, what sort of measures I might be putting in place. The truth is that subliminal, uh, uh, at a, a subconscious level, um, I have already accepted this risk. Um, and at a certain level, it doesn't really bother me. The issue, of course, is that around me are going to be a whole set of people um, who it really does concern, and they sit right on the other end. I'll just flag them up now. There we go. So it's really about managing those two, um, uh, those two extremes, and I think that is really going to be the primary managerial challenge over the next couple of months, because people are going to have to return to work, um, but how that happens is going to be, have to be quite delicately crafted to make sure that we can capture or at least keep those two um, uh, sets of people on board um, uh, within that, uh, that wider process. So let's move on and look at a couple of other things then. And this is about less about the virus itself um, and more about people's reactions to working alone, which is basically what most people have had to do over the past, at least the past month or so. So here are a couple of uh, alternatives, um, the old classic introvert, extrovert um, uh, continuum there. Um, and if we just put a couple more up. And there we go. And again, um, if we just put the continuums on there, I think it's worth asking yourself right now as we as we chat through this what your own experience of all this has been because like i said at the start we are all facing the same circumstances the requirement to work from home in whatever form exactly that might take but as individuals that will affect us in very very different ways so again just as a kind of a marker i'm just going to put myself on there there we go and on the second one and what you can see really is that whilst obviously the, the lockdown has been quite inconvenient for me in the same way that it's been inconvenient for everyone, um, it hasn't really, I think, bothered me in the same way that it has done other people, um, or at least some of my colleagues. And that's quite discernible when I have Zoom meetings with them, uh, when I you know, receive emails from them about what's going on and how they're managing their workload. That's quite clear. And some people find this experience of working alone quite paralyzing. Um, I quite enjoy it um, because as I see it, it grants me or awards me enormous autonomy. But again, 
that's my perception of what's come out of this and it's quite clear as i've said just in my own little sphere um from looking at people's emails looking at people what people say we're in meetings that actually they've found this quite disturbing um other people i think have found it difficult to keep motivated um they like and enjoy having other people around them they need that to keep their their energy and initiative up uh, and it's difficult for them to self-motivate under these circumstances so again my suggestion is that just undertaking this as a little exercise is quite useful for you first to kind of pin down exactly where you stand on these matters as you reflect over what's happened in the past month but also if you're in charge of crafting the uh, the return to work policy or managing uh, the process of people returning to work which I, I dare say many of you will be um, then we need to think about the whole spectrum of opinion here and the fact that there have been winners um, uh, from the, the lockdown. It is interesting to see uh, people openly advocating um, um, that in fact you know, we could continue with this, that, you know, this isn't a problem, they don't mind working at home, it has certain advantages and I for one was quite surprised by that um, but I, I find that indicative, I think that's interesting, the extent to which uh, some people have, have really normalized what's going on and, and see the benefits and I foresee that there are potentially going to be some issues with uh, persuading people to come back um, uh, remarkable um, uh, or, or as that might be um, uh, given the the strangeness of the, uh, the situation we find ourselves in so um, let's move on then and let's look at what we can actually do about all of this because in a sense what I've done I think I've set up the theoretical framework I've looked at some of the problems um, what what can we what sort of strategies can we adopt what kind of behaviors perhaps do we need to exhibit um, um, as, as managers and leaders to try and work our way through what is going to be quite a complicated period so I'm going to use a, a table from Keith Grint um, he's a lecturer up at the Warwick Business School at the moment um, and he says that essentially when analyzing almost any situation um, you can break it down into the these three points um, about how all these three descriptors in terms of how you deal with it you can look at the situation as a crisis you can look at the situation as something um, extremely complicated but ultimately rationalizable uh, or you can look at the situation as being complex and many of you will be familiar perhaps with the, the phenomena of wicked problems um, which basically belong under the, uh, the, the complex uh, heading you can see there so the thing about crises is um, they're immediate um, and what they engender or what they legitimize uh, is a very authoritarian style of leadership and management and there's something that happens I've used a fire in a room but basically uh, the, the conditions we've been living under are equate to a, a crisis or have been interpreted as being a crisis so you have a virus rampant in society and what that means is that people in authority the government or management you know, tiers of management in organizations are, are authorized to basically say do as I say um, we've got an emergency um, you must follow me you must do uh, what you're told and what's more you must do it now uh, there is no time for debate or discussion uh, and my interpretation really the events of the past month or more really is that we've been you know, living through a series of those that the government has been authorized to tell us exactly what to do and how to do it and of course at a lower level within organizations that's triggered a domino effect uh, where managers have said look we, we need to do this we need to do it now uh, yes it's all new but I'm afraid you just have to knuckle down and, and do as you're told now that's fine um, and that that works and there are some situations um, particularly sort of dire emergencies like fires where actually that's entirely appropriate uh, and people have to do that and that's the right reaction but the problem um, with treating everything as a crisis is that authority gradually seeps away um, you can't sustain this position it's a, it's a good position to occupy for a short period of time but you have to move because authority frays around the edges people chafe at it uh, and particularly uh, where you're managing people at a distance which is what we're all doing at the moment your ability in the end to sustain consent for this type of approach um, uh, is, is fairly limited and what we're seeing now and what we're going to see over the next few days uh, next week is the government gently pivoting I think from from this position to another position and it's going to have to pivot and with that pivot um, I suggest um, uh, we should start to pivot as well but we have an immense problem um, because what we would normally do perhaps under these uh, similar circumstances is this the, is the moment we'd make the transition to treating things as complex uh, as complicated and we would reach for the manual now unfortunately there is no manual uh, for dealing with this there is no precedent the last major pandemic in this country was about 100 years ago and all that corporate knowledge has, has long since disappeared 
Um, incidentally, it's been pointed out that a number of East Asian countries have dealt with this much more effectively, it's alleged, um, than the UK. That's partly because, of course, about 10 years ago, they had a chance to do a, a sort of minor dress rehearsal for this. And consequently, their pivot to treating this problem as a complicated one and saying, right, well, we know what we need to do. We just need to follow the process. Where's the manual? And we can implement this managerially is much easier. And unfortunately for us here in Britain, uh, unless you're fortunate enough to be in an organization that has actually uh, planned off against a, a pandemic. There's no pivot to the complicated situation or treating it as complexity. There is no manual. People are probably writing manuals at the moment, but they're not, they're not available or particularly useful at this moment. So what I'm saying is that the, the jump has actually got to be right down to treating this as a complex problem. Um, and that in itself is quite difficult. Um, but you can see here that if we treat this as a problem that doesn't have any precedent, essentially what that means as leaders and managers, we have to step back and instead of telling people what to do, um, we have to start asking the questions, we have to start involving the right people and we have in a sense to step back and let the people who are innovators kind of lead in a lot of localized situations um, at a much lower level within the organization because it won't work to continually i think um, um, to continually uh, you know make or, um, uh, or or create new and rather authoritarian policies that the, you know, the, the consent for that isn't going to sustain um, if we look at this and we use a couple of analogies for what a, what a complex problem looks like, I think it is quite useful to, to conceptualize it in a number of ways. The first is that um, complex problems react to you. They, they don't stand still. And I think a useful um, analogy here is, is, is boxing um, in, in many ways. So if you train to box, you hit a punch bag, um, it returns to the same point every time you hit it again, it comes back. It's good training. Um, and that in many ways is, a, is an example of someone perhaps dealing with a complicated problem. The, the issue when you move to complexity is like stepping into a ring with a human opponent and the opponent moves, um, the opponent learns to anticipate um, uh, your actions and it, it moves around you. And a, a complex problem is a reactive problem in that way. It doesn't stand still. The second uh, immense difficulty with dealing with these kind of issues is that the complex problem, um, <clears throat> sorry, the complex problem uh, is usually, there's a lot of, um, should we say, conflicting certitudes about it. So people are, are in profound disagreement about what has caused it, uh, perhaps profound disagreement about what it is, and certainly in profound disagreement about what to do next. Um, and I think you can see that with the virus at the moment. There's a huge amount of um, uh, un not just uncertainty about what to do, but profound disagreement about what to do and what should have been done, perhaps, and, uh, and whether what has been done has necessarily been a good thing. Now, in that scenario, it becomes extremely difficult for people in authority, leadership, management um, um, to impose their will um, because there's just too much contradiction. And in many ways, I think you can see this at the national level where the government has tended to, to tread quite softly. It's tended to follow public opinion, perhaps more than shape it and what I'm suggesting to you on a, uh, on a, on a more micro level is um, don't be afraid of following a similar uh, approach to this because if you try and impose um, uh, a one-size-fits-all solution to this in a rather crisis-driven authoritarian way uh, you're going to get significant kickback um, um, and I can already see this developing um, uh, in my own workplace where people are already, uh, in a sense, reaching for the health and safety handbook and saying, well, I, I'm not going to be pushed or pulled on this one. Um, um, and it's going to be very, very difficult. Managing that is going to be um, problematic. And I think the more authoritarian managers are over this, the bigger the kickback that they're going to experience uh, as they try and bring people back into the, into the workplace. So it's about stepping back. It's about asking the questions and finding out where people stand on this um, uh, in your team and then seeing what can be done to ameliorate um, conditions or make conditions suitable for people to, um, uh, to return to work with confidence. And the only way people are really going to achieve that is by asking a lot of questions uh, and by doing a lot of, uh, a lot of consultation. So we'll, uh, we'll leave Grint there for the moment um, and move on to um, uh, another way of looking at things in very much the same way, but just um, um, rehashing it slightly. You can look at problems essentially as being acute, systemic or endemic. And like I've said, if you see it as acute, it does allow you to legitimize authority. How long you can sustain it, I think, is a, is a moot point, something worth, um, uh, worth considering. Unfortunately, the time for analyzing and reforming your processes um, it probably lies in the future, I would suggest. At the moment, people have been too busy firefighting. So the next stage really is this jump 
to asking questions, delegating responses. And I think if you allow people to kind of show their innovation, you'll find that actually, and allow them a bit of agency, they will fit much more comfortably and much more efficiently back into something that resembles normal life or former life um, uh, than, you, than you might expect. Next slide, please. So very quickly then, I'm just going to shuttle through a, a couple of the problems and can compare and contrast them. So this was the problem we faced about a month ago. Um, so suddenly uh, what happened, I think, is analogous to someone just flicking a switch or, or pulling the mains out in a house. Everyone must work from home. We're going to turn society off. Click. Um, and that kind of crisis driven response um, um, you know, where people were essentially following the commander and doing as they were told generated a number of, of new issues. So if we just roll through those now, Andy, so do people have sufficient kit and equipment to do their job? What are the implications of health and safety? How do we deal with communication and control, which was really the topic of, of my last webinar? Uh, what about people's circumstances? How do they um, uh, impact on what they can actually achieve? Um, and if we can just, there's a couple more. There we go. There's the uh, the inevitable people preferred things as they were and that's an enormous sort of an emotional journey that people are on and finally um, there was a choice I think um, that's been obscured by the sheer pace of events here uh, we chose to deal with these as a crisis um, there's nothing we can do now to unpick that um, but we do I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that this issue could also have been handled as a complicated one, um, the implementation of procedure, and indeed it was um, uh, in, another, in a number of countries. Um, I think regrettably not um, an option open to us here in Britain, um, but let's not forget that that is one way of dealing um, with this kind of issue. Um, or it could have been potentially, even at this stage, handled as a complex um, um, problem. And I think in that sense, um, it would have been a very different narrative where people would have said, look, um, we have a variety of different options here, but we need to remember that as with all complex problems, um, solutions tend to generate new problems. But having said all of that, uh, it was dealt with as a crisis problem. Uh, society was switched off. Um, and now we face the problem of switching society back on again or switching our workplaces back on again. So uh, next slide, please, Andy. So here we have it. Um, and I think what's different now um, and what's different this time and to sustain the, the, uh, the metaphor of, of, of turning things on, turn things off, is that we could, in theory, um, be just as authoritarian about this particular problem. Everyone must return to work. And the government could say everyone must go back and anybody caught malingering is going to face a £60 fine. Um, but I think you would agree with me that that isn't really an option. That isn't how things are going to, to work. Uh, play out and so to extend the, um, the, the switching you know turning all the electricity off in your house in one go it's not going to be a case of, uh, of flicking the fuse box and putting it all back on uh, it's going to be a case of turning all the appliances back on one after another in a, in a sequential way and how that's planned um, uh, and the precise sequence in which that's done um, both nationally and within the context of an organization um, is going to be need to be carefully planned so here are a couple of the issues just to flag them up so who, the issues with health and safety, back to our old friend personal circumstances again. Um, what do we do if there's a resurgence? What do we do if people uh, fall sick? Because there's gonna be a lot more of those um, uh, as thing, as uh, than there were previously. And finally, we're gonna have this new cohort of people um, uh, who quite like things as they were um, and are in no particular rush uh, but to come back after a, a month of uh, working on their own. So again, we have this choice. Um, and I think we have to accept that we have a choice here. Uh, we can treat it as another crisis um, um, and, and compel people and just tell people that this is what they have to do. Um, we can treat it as complicated um, and there may be procedures that you can implement um, that will be on a case by case basis but my suggestion is that you really look at it as a, as a complex problem and, and you step back you ask a lot of questions you find out as far as you can what's going on in people's lives on an individual level and you discuss really and consult on how it is that you people want to return to work and how it is that you want them to and you find your way through it in that way uh, rather than just um, um, trying to switch all the lights back on um, uh, in one go. So to conclude then, a few um, pieces of advice really on how to uh, approach all of this. I think it is worth um, framing all this um, as a, a situation that has created winners and losers. And that in a sense is quite countercultural because we've been told we're all in this together, uh, that we're all in one boat. Um, for my part, I challenge that. I don't think that's true. Um, I think it is a commonly faced crisis. Well, the, fa the, the, fight, the crisis is being faced commonly, but everyone's experience of it is very, very different. Uh, and if we assume that it's all been good or all been bad for everyone, um, then we're gonna implement or try to implement a lot of policies that, that just don't work. 
work and you're going to run into a lot of resistance uh, from various groups of people both the winners and the losers um, it is important therefore to consider how everyone else sees it uh, as well as you and i think if you divide up all the the, mic the problems on a micro level uh, not just the virus as a whole but all the uh, other issues that lead into it as acute systemic or endemic what that will allow you to do is generate a, um, a series of priorities about what you think the most important things are to achieve as society and your uh, place of work gradually comes out of lockdown in order and once you've got a sense of um, uh, priority you've established an order of priority you will be able to make decisions and i think that um, people are looking to people in others in uh, in authority and leadership positions to make decisions at the moment at the highest level in the government but also uh, at organizational level and um, over the next week or so, that's going to be critical, particularly once the government has, has made its position clear. Um, the pressure then flicks to all people in, the, in more junior positions of leadership and management to show that they too have a plan um, which they can communicate clearly um, to um, the people um, who are working for them and that they've taken account of their, their needs and their positions. Um, um, on uh, on how they on how they've experienced the crisis uh, and what they think the best way out um, or the best way back uh, might be. So thank you all very much um, for listening in. I hope that's been thought provoking uh, and, and useful as well. I'm just going to conclude on one slide, which I'm just going to leave in the background while I take any any questions um, from anyone in the audience. Um, that paper which you see there, which is available um, at the Institute for Global Change, is certainly the most interesting one that I've run across. It's very well researched, it's very succinct, uh, and it's very clear. And I think if you, you if you just flick through it, even if you don't have a lot of time, just skim through. I think it's a very useful document to just contextualise everything that has happened. Uh, and then it's it's also a very nice exposition uh, of all the sort of the potential exits that there are from the uh, the situation we find ourselves in. So there we go. Um, thank you again for listening in, and I'm very happy to take any questions or thoughts from the uh, from the audience. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, James. Um, we just to give people a, a chance to, to get some questions uh, across to us if, uh, if there's anything that they want to ask. I want to come back to something you spoke about, which was people's um, approaches to returning to the workplace. Mm. And I think it also ties into something you spoke about in your previous presentation, which was almost the one third, two third rule. Mm. Um, and I feel like that might be a nice way to actually kind of talk about that now and how that may sort of apply to returning to the workplace. Yes, I think I, I offer a little bit of context here, and I think it's something that shows how shape how shaped we all are by our own predispositions. So, to me um, personally, because of the way I've perceived how things have unfolded, I'm actually quite keen in many ways to get back, um, and that doesn't sort of hold many fears for me. As I said earlier, I've, I have a sort of select sort of fatalistic view about how things have unfolded. <laughs> Um, but what has surprised me, you know, and therefore it has surprised me, I suppose, is to discover how many people are, are, are very, you know, are not keen um, uh, and hold significant fears. And I do understand that. So one of the realizations I've come to, and I think it's quite a nice blend of those ideas of the, the one third, two thirds rule is that if I were to implement a policy, um, which I would have to, if I were in a position of authority about how my organization were coming back, I can't rely on this idea that it, it's all okay and people are keen to come back. And yeah, like you say, um, the idea of allowing people perhaps twice as long as myself to you know, have a think about things, to reflect upon, to balance them up, um, I think, yeah, would be a, a nice rule of the thumb perhaps to use uh, when you're approaching this. And um, I think we'd probably be straying more into um, the areas around sort of decision making and, and judgment to, to look at it. But going back to the, um, the slide where you talked about whether things are acute, systemic or endemic also comes down to prioritisation and task management. Um, again, thinking about the kind of the rule you've just discussed and some of the aspects as to how you manage teams. Um, it also comes down to sort of the goal setting and the priority setting. So how, how could people approach that during this time on both a remote basis, but also applying that to the kind of the return to work, not return to normal. I think that's going to be the next uh, buzz phrase, which is we're not returning to the new normal. But how, how could that sort of interact as well? Um, well, I think the first thing that I would be, I am waiting for, frankly, um, and I will be waiting for is to look to see what, what's going to be announced next week, um, because that's in a sense, that's the broadest context. Um, and 
in a funny sense, that's going to generate a lot of pressure on people um, in organizations everywhere because the people's first reaction to that will be, is, oh, look, the government has produced its plan. There it is. Uh, now, what about what about the plan for me? Um, you know, how is that going to be generated? Um, and I think prior to that, uh, the release of that plan, it would, I think, do people a little good just to reflect on what it is they're going to do next week, because I think they will be expected to react to that. Um, and unfortunately, they'll be expected to react fairly quickly. I mean, people won't expect an, a, an immediate production of something, uh, but they will expect, I suspect, something before the end of next week as a response to that, um, some kind of communication. Now, I think there's a danger that at this point, people um, can scare the horses a little bit because one potential reaction to that is to say, right, okay, lockdown's you know, it's done, it's lifting, um, it's time to get back now. And it's quite clear that that sort of policy, I think it will run into significant resistance. So I think in some ways, wherever it's feasible, you need to get a sense of just where your team stand um, uh, on, you know, how they, where they stand in terms of how they perceive the threat from the, the virus themselves as individuals, but also what their experience of the past month has actually been. Uh, and once you've got a clearer sense of that, you'll be able to craft something that's actually much more personalized um, um, and takes account of that variation in, um, um, uh, yeah, in, in experience really um, over the past month or so. So it's about looking at what the government's going to come out with, realizing that a response from people in authority is going to you know, fall on, you know, be commensurate with that, or it's going to be a sort of domino effect uh, and being prepared, I think, to step back a little bit from some of the announcements that have been made as a response um, uh, earlier in, uh, in March and uh, try a slightly different tack. That's great, thank you. So, um, okay, so we've had um, uh, two, two comments. So one is um, Gartner recommended uh, a business strategy that has multiple strands allowing flexibility and for testing solutions for returning to work. Um, do you like that as an idea? I suppose the question should be, do you see that as a suitable approach? Yes, I like I like particularly like the idea of, of testing, um, because if you're in, in new circumstances, then you know, that allows for trial and error. Um, I think perhaps one of the shames really of the, the last couple of months or so is that there was this one size fits all that was implemented very, very rapidly. People have argued that that was necessary, you know, and we'll just have to leave it at that. What's done has been done. But I think what's interesting is that we can be a lot more nuanced um, uh, and sophisticated about how we exit now. Um, we've got a little bit more uh, space for maneuver. So any approach that sort of um, suggests a little bit of trial and error, or at least builds the the, um, um, the, the capacity for trial and error, and I think would be a good thing. Um, and I, I do apologise if I provoked uh, someone with uh, with using the phrase "the new normal." Um, they have uh, they have told us that they didn't like it, and I, I do understand. I'm not a fan of it myself. Um, but it leads into the question: um, after making potentially radical changes to their organisations, how do you think businesses can build in flexibility and capability to pivot? in reaction to social and business circumstances. Could I just ask for a little bit of, um, do you mind if I just run that back? Are we looking forward here to a guarding against a, a future uh, occurrence or are we just talking about dealing with what has happened? I think this is probably a future re reoccurrence potentially. Uh, yeah, that's just been confirmed as well. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I, I'm a great fan of the the, what are, you know, the contingency scenario planning. So this was developed by Shell back in the, the 80s with a couple of Dutch researchers. And what ha really happens is it, it's, a, it's a variant on the manual um, or the complicated um, uh, framework for viewing problems. And basically, you, you have a manual on the shelf, literally or, or metaphorically, you periodically update it. And it, it just looks at scenario planning. Um, now, my guess is that most, if not all, large firms have this anyway. It's just that this scenario uh, probably wasn't anticipated um, uh, in the the, you know, the current, the recent editions. So it needs to be built in. And I think my preferred outcome will be for this one: be you, you look at scenario, you go back to scenario planning, and you just build in uh, resurgence of um, uh, of COVID nineteen um, or similar into the um, uh, into that manual. Uh, okay, so I'll, um, I'll give people a, a, a few more minutes as uh, an opportunity if there's any other questions that they'd like to ask James during this time. Um, for those of you who, I just want to add sort of very quickly, for those of you um, who have booked a one-to-one -one, uh, with James after these sessions, uh, if you could please confirm your availability, 
uh, either through the chat function, if you can send that to, to John, who is um, who is monitoring those, um, or if you could please email uez at essex.ac.uk to confirm. Uh, John's uh, already sent out some emails with your um, your timings and your Zoom room links in, but if you could please confirm your availability, that would help just to make sure we, we run those uh, efficiently. Uh, I think just coming back to your, your previous um, uh, session as well, James, which are, we have got available and we'll, we'll share with attendees today um, in the emails that go out after this. You spoke about how previously uh, that was very much about directing your team. Um, and now's an opportunity for reflection. Um, and it's about that that balance uh, as a leader, but that strategic approach to change. And I, I, I thought of it as kind of action and emotion um, and the cycle that, that the leaders have to go through. So they need to not just be aware of them, their team, but themselves as well. And obviously we, we talk about leaders putting their team first, um, but there has to be an aspect to which the leaders look after themselves during this time. For the people who are in those positions, uh, again, I'm going to. I feel like I'm asking you a very difficult question. What, what, what should they be doing for themselves if there's no one to to take that direction from? Um, whereas their teams would obviously be looking up to them. Where can leaders look at this time? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I think again, I would be looking at um, documents like the one I've just flagged up there on the um, on the uh, the screen. You can see. Look at what governments plan now. I think what leaders are, are there to do is to kind of act I would argue as, um, as sort of large umbrellas they're there to kind of capture a lot of information um, and, and keep that from dropping directly on their subordinates heads um, and then they're there to filter it to process it and turn it into something that's really useful for the people underneath them and that's kind of the responsibility of a leader that's why people in authority are, are granted authority are granted privileges um, and I think what I've sort of suggested or described here actually should be review, should be seen really by people in authority positions as a, as a respite because if you try and pose as the commander all the time, um, you're going to burn out. Um, it's a very seductive position to take um, because people come to you with questions. Um, um, it, it, it's nice in a way, um, but constantly being in the spotlight that like that is enormously you know, stressful and difficult um, because essentially you're not allowed to say to anyone, uh, "I'm sorry, I don't." know um, because if you if you say that you're relinquishing your position in command now if you if you pivot and make this move and say well we're now going to view things in a more complex way um, it actually grants you intellectual and, and, and social and, you know, and emotional space because you're no longer this font of all wisdom um, what you have to be able to do is craft quite thoughtful questions for people um, and let them go away uh, and do the the intellectual um, uh, heavy lifting and emotional heavy lifting as they begin to change their perception about how things are now to do that um, you, I think you need to equip yourself intellectually, which is why I'm sort of proposing that you look at papers like this one here um, um, and you look at what the government comes out with and, and other um, information that's out there so that you can craft those questions. But I'd suggest in terms of people looking for respite after an exhausting you know, month and a half, and it has been absolutely exhausting, um, um, then yeah, I, I think you should look at this change or embrace this change as an opportunity uh, not to be um, uh, the, the person um, uh, on, the, on the pedestal uh, in the spotlight and say, no, we're going to reverse this a little bit. Um, rather than taking the questions, I, I'm going to start asking them. Uh, I think that ties in nicely to one of the points I remember you making last time, which is during this time, there has to be a greater reliance uh, and emphasis on delegated authority and actually seeking that support from, from your team as well. So um, we've had a question come in, which was um, a recent study showed that despite management thinking that they do it, employees do not feel that their ideas are listened to or acted upon. Do you see this as the opportunity to really listen to the team? Yes, I mean, there, I, I like questions like that because I, I think they're very accurate, really. Um, and, uh, people, subordinates often view these exercises as sort of lip service and you know, an opportunity for them. Their, their views to be gathered, put in a file, and for the file to be put in a cupboard somewhere and the, and the door shut on it. Um, I mean, how you choose to deal with this is entirely up to you as, as a person in, in authority, as a leader, as a manager. Um, yeah, you can pay lip service to it if you want. You can do a Q&A and then just file it away. But people, you know, they're not daft and they will, in a sense, they'll judge you by your actions um, and people will very quickly pick up 
whether or not um, uh, their ideas are really feeding in um, uh, to what's happening around them. I think when I've had to deal with this myself, albeit not in, in crisis situations, I've always said to people, um, look, um, what I can promise is I'm going to listen to you. Um, uh, and people are usually quite um, astute about whether they've really been listening. I can't promise that we're going to do exactly what um, uh, you're, going, you're telling me uh, because I have to balance your views uh, along with the views of everybody else. Um, but that I found is usually quite a, a good approach. People will accept that, um, particularly if they perceive that you are, they are being listened to. And I've often found actually in these situations, particularly where there's a lot of discontent in the workplace, that uh, oddly you might think that what people really want is the, the perception that someone is actually sitting down and, and giving them half an hour. They don't actually always want the world to change. And, and I know that might sound curious, but I can only offer you that as my own experience of, of having dealt with this um, on numerous occasions in the past. It's the being listened to bit that really counts. Um, the actions, yeah, they, they need to be there, but I don't think there are many people who expect the whole world to, to pivot around um, um, what, what it is that they wish to achieve. Uh, and the person who asked that question has followed up more with a statement than anything else, which is um, the hive mind, and they've been reading too much science fiction. <laughs> that one. So um, we'll uh, sort of we'll, we'll allow sort of one or two more minutes just to, to see if there are any any more questions that that do come in. Um, just want to say thank you very much to everyone who has asked something this morning um, and for for joining us so far. Um, I suppose really again so w when we look at the next steps um, and uh, looking at your the, the breakdown of crisis, complicated and, and complex scenarios. Um, as you kind of pointed out, we, we kind of move from reactive to proactive um, through um, crisis and complicated and then complex is a combination of the two. Um, how, how can we prepare for that? And, and I know sort of some of it again, uh, coming back to the question is about actually maybe speaking to your teams and, and listening to them at this time. But how, how, how might that look in terms of a, a business's approach? Well, what, what would I be doing um, if I was still back in my, my previous managerial positions? Um, and I'm afraid in a rather boring way, um, what, I would be, what I would probably be looking at is a, is a gigantic spreadsheet that I would <laughs> have created. And I will be looking at every function within the, the organization of which I was a part. Uh, and I would have broken it down. I'd have looked at who, who was who was involved in those functions so who have we got who needs to be there and i'll be looking at how we could do those with the minimum number of people so what's the minimum threshold to achieve each each particular area of functionality i'd also be looking at the resources so which bits of the organization would i actually have to open up um, which bits could i just keep shut um, um, for as long as i could or for however long the government um, um, required me to do so. Um, I'd also be keeping, um, I think, a certain amount of, of, you know, just a record really of people's personal circumstances um, and in my interactions with them. Where were they? What was going on? Um, what was my impression? Um, having spoken to them on Zoom, what were they telling me in emails? Because there's there's a lot going on out there, and I'm I'm seeing that you know even in just my you know, my my work at the moment, which you can discern. And it's back to this thing about everybody being in a very different boat. So I think what I would be what I would have been doing and will be sort of still working on now is really quite a fine toothed analysis of my people um, and my resources, and then saying, well, look what how can i try and get the best bits or the most fitting bits of the jigsaw together and again for in terms of how i work i'm afraid that's a, that's usually a spreadsheet boring as that is um but the, the, you know, there's no there's no fixed way in which you might achieve that that's up to you um and then i would be aware that the government's plan is coming out i would know that fairly shortly on the heels of that there will be an expectation for me on me uh, as a push in authority to say well okay there's the government there's the government's plan um and this is what that this looks like down here uh, in organization y um and that would be quite a tentative process really uh, it would probably involve a lot of emails to people uh, and a lot of meetings on the back of those emails just to say look we're you know we, we need to gradually make our way back. I think I'll be emphasizing gradualism quite a lot just to make sure that the, the horses weren't too scared by this. But also, as I was going through my people uh, and looking at them, I would be trying to identify those people who are actually quite impatient to get back and, and find this a, sort of a major imposition and approaching them and saying, look, I, I know that you know, it, it would seem to me that you're quite, you're quite keen 
um, in this particular situation, because I can see that enthusiasm, are you willing to step forward perhaps and, and maybe pick up a little bit more than you normally would? So it's, it's quite a differentiated approach and it's quite a lot of work. Um, on, on, an, on, uh, on a manager's shoulders. In my previous employment, however, we had the advantage uh, of routinely uh, writing quite detailed annual reports and, 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 uh, and mid-year reports. Um, so there was quite a wealth of information on people's performances and so on. So I would, again, in those circumstances where I back there, as I was a year ago, uh, that's probably what I would also be drawing on. So it is, it's quite a, um, uh, it's quite a fine tooth process. It, it means a certain amount of work, but then I always think that if you are privileged enough to be a manager, Manager, a leader, someone in authority, you know, that's what the privilege is all about. You know, you're, you're paid and, um, and you're given the status to make those kind of decisions uh, and to do that kind of um, uh, work. And I think what's quite rewarding over time is that if you do that carefully, people appreciate that. It's the old individualized consideration um, that, that Bass talks about. And people notice that. Um, that's my experience. They, they realize that, um, that you're, you're viewing them very much as an individual. Okay. So we just had someone just comment that they sort of completely agree with with what you just said um and it's a, an opportunity to eradicate busy work and and get onto the focus of uh, of the business and, and the matters that are priority so um we we haven't had any any further questions in so i think uh, at this point what i'm what i'm going to say is uh, thank you very much for your time this morning james really uh, appreciate uh, taking the opportunity to to talk us through this and the the webinar itself is being recorded um so we will be able to share this with you uh once that is uh it's been processed and uh and it's been uploaded to the university's uh video accounts um we'll be sharing that with you uh through emails in the in the next week or so hopefully um for those of you who've got a one-to-one -one booked with james again uh if you haven't already if i could just ask you to let John know if you are still able to make those um, or to email uez at essex.ac.uk. Um, there is also James's previous uh, webinar which we have available and I'll be speaking with John and we'll make sure that we can uh, include a link to that in the emails that go out uh, after today. Um, but for now, for this morning, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, please get in touch. Um, to see more about our upcoming events, you can visit Eventbrite. And if you look for the University of Essex Enterprise Zone, you will um, you'll be able to see our next sessions on sales and marketing. And we're also running a, a series on virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, we have other subjects which we are we are fitting in uh, across those areas as well. Um, but thank you for taking the, the time to join us this morning. Um, Please look after yourselves, stay safe, stay well, stay healthy. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you all to the next, uh, next webinar. So 